Outrocast. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the decades of great art. We're going to delve into the decades of great art in a bit. But first, uh, Radio Days and Glamping, as far as I know, that's the latest release thanks to the Omnivore team. That's correct? Yeah. So when there's a Roger Manning song, it's I'd say it's four songs in one a lot of the time or three songs in one. It takes a lot to do your songs because not only do they have to be hooky and well produced, but there's a lot of complex vocal harmonies and all that. So when did you actually finish uh, the Radio Days and Glamping combined release? Well, thanks for noticing uh, the layers of effort and production that go into all this stuff. And it's only because that's what I enjoy. That's what my heroes inspired me to do. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the the bar I have for myself and just the natural extension of my tendencies when putting something out there. And um, mm-hmm. uh, I officially finished all the work on this most recent EP uh, probably this time last year. It was the beginning of 2023. And then you set the wheels in motion to actually get the artwork done and all the logistics to present some kind of finished product. Were you simultaneously working on that and any of the licorice quartet stuff? No licorice quartet had wrapped about six months prior. Got Um, it. Yeah. So licorice quartet, my impression was it was everything done in a bit like it started around the same time and then rolled out in little doses. Is that correct? Yeah. We started all 12 songs somewhere around 20 uh 17 18 19 like began all the recording uh and then we just picked four songs to just finish because we could have worked on all of them forever and we're like no let's concentrate on these four they seem to make a good coupling and just wrap them up so we can start getting something out there and doing all that all that stuff that needs to be done that we don't want to do because it's not fun creative recording music stuff um, and that brought us to the first EP, which uh, we slated for release in March of 2020. And we all know what happened in the U.S. in March of 2020. So uh, it became this weird mixed blessing where we had music to share with everybody. Um, and in a lot of ways, we had people at home and not distracted too much. They could focus on things um, they wanted to focus on. And uh, thankfully, it made us and them very, very happy to have new music at that time. Uh, and so just for the next three years, two and a half years, whatever, we continued with that campaign, including finishing the other eight songs for the following two EPs, uh, long distance. So we, mm-hmm. like a lot of folks, we're just file sharing, trying to complete our ideas and, and produce this music together as a trio with everybody weighing in and having their opinion and then like it kind of going through some kind of funnel to have it all uh, be wrapped up. But it, it gave us a great opportunity to stay focused on something positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, uh, the fans couldn't have been happier about having new music from us at that time. So it, it it ended up working out as challenging as it was. So that was a series of EPs. Glamping was an EP. Radio days is an EP. Am I reading correctly that you're done with full lengths? Uh, well, no, I mean, I grew up with full lengths. I love that album experience. Um, but as you can tell from the Licorice Quartet stuff, I mean, those those EPs are one album. In fact, uh, uh, 11 of those songs were released in Japan in, in more of an album setting, um, thankfully. Uh, there was a label over there that wanted to put it all out as a, one package, and we were excited about that. Um, no, the way uh, my career is certainly gone, uh, it's such an undertaking just to get one song done that mm-hmm. I don't, you know, and then I'm juggling that between a freelance career and all the things I do to, you know, uh, have my uh, needs met uh, with my living standards and, and so forth. And so, yeah, um, I'd rather get something out to people than have them wait eight, nine years in between offerings. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So that's that's the, the EP. The EP is like a little, you know, come take this miniature journey with me. <laughs> we're we're going to spend a few hours at Disneyland as opposed to a whole day at Disneyland kind of thing. 
the the freelance career that you just referenced, you know, anytime there's a Beck release, presumably you're on it. Anytime there's a Morrissey thing, there you are. But did that whole side of your career basically start because of Jerry Finn sessions? Yes. Um, in a nutshell, I mean, you know, jellyfish kind of became my calling card for people who didn't know me from Adam. And, uh, I was always interested in doing studio work. It was never a goal of mine per se, but I grew up a fan of a lot of those folks who made all of those records we know and love. Um, and just musician to musician was really inspired by their abilities because I, even as a young man, I knew like, it's not just everybody that gets the call to do these things. And you, you would see their names repeated. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I was pretty aware of what it took, certainly for standards in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, things have changed a lot since those times, obviously. But um, so uh, I always fancied myself that just being something else, if I was ever called on to do, I think it would be fun and I'd probably enjoy the challenge, but I had no, I had no way of understanding how to break into that business. Um, even though I was starting to meet more and more music makers in Los Angeles, certainly. Um, and then, yeah, I got lucky. Uh, Jerry Finn was a jellyfish fan. Mm -hmm. Um, his career was starting to take off after green day. Yeah. Uh, as a producer. And, uh, he was working with a band called, uh, coward. Yeah. And they, uh, thankfully were jellyfish fans. And they were a guitar group. And they were like, you know, we'd love to have some extra keys on these songs. It'd be perfect. And Jerry's like, great, that's a great idea. Who do you want to get? Well, we'd love to get Roger Manning, but he's not a session musician. He's a guy who's in a regular band. And those guys don't do session work. And Jerry was like, well, that's ridiculous. Maybe, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Let's just call him up and see. Like the worst case is that he'll say, no, thank you. Not interested. But they're like, no, we can't do, we can't bother him. He's busy doing his own career. And at that time, I'd been doing Imperial Drag. That album yeah. had already come out. Um, what they didn't know is that, unfortunately, Imperial Drag was coming to an end. And I was, uh, I was unattached to a group and on my own and, frankly, at a loss for what my next move was going to be in my career. This was in the beginning of 97. Uh, mid 97 and uh thankfully jerry who he and i shared a good good old-fashioned southern california kind of punk rock ethos you yeah. know he he was very he was very his whole aesthetic was very um diy punk rock stuff that, that was his roots even though he was now making commercial records i was like just just freaking call him up which he did and i said oh my i literally said to him oh my god not only would I love to do this, the project sounds fantastic, but I've been waiting for somebody to call me to do this because I didn't know how to tell people I was interested in doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that couldn't have been a more positive experience. He, of course, got me to do other things after that. Uh, yes, and then joining the every Beth Blink band. 182 record, Kara's yeah. Flowers, who became Maroon 5, ultimately. The, the Kind of the list goes on and on and on. And I just... When I looked at your discography and I, I liked that Coward record a lot and it's great to see Shep Goodman is now an A&R guy in his own right and Billy Anlou Megidis played in another band that was signed, etc. I just saw the common thread in all that was Jerry Finn. So had that yeah. one Coward record not happened, ha would Beck have happened or is that entirely independent? No, Beck, Beck would have happened. In fact, my association with, with Beck led to even more session work. Thankfully, because it, it kind of became fashionable for a brief period there where producers were hiring us as a rhythm section, actually. Justin on bass, Joey on drums, Smokey on guitar at the time. We were often getting calls and found ourselves teaming up on projects, which mm -hmm. I, I, I thought was just fantastic. I thought I was in love with us as a rhythm section. And frankly, I wish we could have made like 50 records that way. We, we made we made a few and some film stuff, but uh, um I'm just thankful any of that happened. Uh, um, now the Beck the Beck thing happened through another series of super random or not not so random coincidences. Um, and uh, so, yeah, ever I mean, ever since '97 '98, 
uh, session work is, you know, comes and goes. Um, and again, I, I kind of jumped track for a while to do my solo records that you first heard in the 2000s. Um, Land of Pure Imagination and Catnip Dynamite and stuff. And I got, I, I disappeared for like two years. People are like, are you even, are you even working on anything right now? I'm like, well, yeah, my solo stuff, but you don't know about it. You haven't heard it. And my plan was not for those records to become all, you know, absorbing and take up all of my time. Uh, but I really kind of just be able to, you know, and you got to be careful out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. You, to, to rudely interrupt you right here. You know, I knew about those records because of our mutual friend, Linus of Hollywood, who's oh, yeah. another guy who's doing random sessions, whose releases sometimes only come out in Japan, et cetera. When yeah. did you kind of realize that there was that sinkhole of artists that kind of like the Spinal Tap cliche are only big in Japan and then they own the rights to their own records in the States? Uh, well, thankfully, uh, Jellyfish, particularly on our second album, Spilt Milk, um, just couldn't have done better in Japan. I mean, it was poised to get even bigger, but we had such a very positive experience. You know, it was, it was quite sad because uh, that Japan experience and then in Australia and then some dates back home, it was, it was pretty clear we were kind of falling apart uh, interpersonally. Yeah. Uh, and it was almost like, yeah, I wish the Japan thing could have saved us because it was such a positive experience. Uh, but thankfully, Imperial Drag, a couple years later, we did just as well there. Uh, and then my solo stuff, that's basically where I had a career was in Japan. Um, and uh, I I fell in love with that country the first time we went there. Um, and it's just always continued to be a, a treat. Like anytime I see where we have a few dates or a couple of weeks in Japan, it's like, oh my God, it's, it's like they haven't been, haven't been over there for a while. I think maybe was it 2018. I don't, I don't remember the last time we were, I was there, but, uh, it can't happen soon enough. In fact, Beck's playing some solo shows over there right now. Just a couple. <laughs> it just sucks. We can't, we can't be with him. Um, but, uh, I always joke with everybody, I don't care how big or small you are, you will feel like a rock star that you dreamed of feeling like at some point in your career because the fan commitment is so intense. Uh, again, whether you've got 20 people at your show or you know 20,000, uh, they adore you with attention and gifts and they know every word to every song and they sing it in phonetic English because they don't, yeah. most of them don't even know what they're singing. Uh, and the effort that they put into letting you know that they care is like most people aren't used to that in any aspect of their life, let alone their music career. Yeah. So you go over there and suddenly you can do no wrong. <laughs> well, who, who doesn't, who does, who doesn't want to be around that 24 seven? Exactly. Unless you're McCartney and uh, you oh. allegedly try and bring weed into the country yeah. and get banned for 30 years. But uh, <laughs> the key is, you know, recapping what we were just talking about. The fortunately for you, the sessions keep coming. We hear you on Justice and the Killers and Daisy Jones and the Barbie soundtrack and Five Seconds of Summer and uh. <laughs> Marilyn Manson. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for the reminders. Sometimes I can feel like I haven't gotten a call in a while. So thank you for reminding me how blessed I have actually been. Well, make sure you get those AFM checks. Uh, you just have to call yeah. the union and go, hey, uh, Roger here, you got anything for me? And A802 in New York will go, yeah, there's a stack over here. Your dues are 38 bucks, Pam. A <laughs> stack uh, would be nice, yeah. <laughs> but the key is, you know, you're steadily working on that end. Through Omnivore, there's those two EPs. Licorice, uh, Licorice Quartet, we got those three EPs, which was basically an album in Japan. Is there anything that we should be looking forward to in the future, or is that just enough? And we should be uh, thankful. Um, let's see. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm on the Barbie movie. There's the, the new Joker movie is going to be coming out. I don't even know what it's called yet with um, mm. uh, with uh, Phoenix, Joaquin yeah. Phoenix. Um, I just played for... Uh, Mark Ronson and Andrew White again on some music they're doing for the new Minecraft movie. Wow. Uh, in fact, the song they hired me to play on, and hopefully there'll be more. I don't know how the score is unfolding, but um, was for a Jack Black song. Oh. Um, 
So, and, and you know what's hilarious and just freaking awesome? Uh, after the Barbie movie came out, I had all these people I'd run into at parties or whatever. I'm like, hey, man, nice work on the Barbie movie. I'd be like, oh, thanks. And be like, wait, how do you even know that I'm on that? Like, that, that's impossible. I haven't, I don't go on social media and say these things. Well, somebody at some point started giving the musicians credit. So my name and Wolfgang Van Halen and Josh yes. Fries and all these other people, our names are actually there, uh, which never happens. Right. Um, uh, and that, so that was an added bonus. Um, uh, and of course, no one expected that movie to get as much attention as it did. Obviously, right. it's done incredibly well. Uh, and I just couldn't be happier for Mark and Andrew, um, who, you know, they obviously have success and names for themselves in the pop world, but they've, they've been exploring the scoring thing and it's really going good for them. And um, I, I've known both of them for a while, but man, I, I've never worked in the trenches with them. What a treat. Um, they're just so on their game. Uh, they made me feel so important and crucial to the project. Mm -hmm. um, we worked very hard and very fast and yet it felt easy going and like we were all having fun. Um, and that's a skill that many producers don't have, frankly. <laughs> I mean, that's a skill I'm still trying to work on when I when I work with other people. And sure, um, so that's just you know, I'm praying to the music gods in the sky. More of that, please. I, I want I want to work with those types of people all the time. And, and frankly, I think we work well together. I think we got great results. Um, and uh, so that's that's been positive. Um, uh, and then I'm actually exploring. Um, Meditation music, sleep, sleep sounds with um, uh, another another gentleman, and um, uh, we're still sussing the name out and stuff. But that world is completely new and different to me. He actually brought me. Uh, he asked, "Is this something that might be of interest to you? Do you have time for this?" You know, and he let me know that that's a different game because it's all about what playlists on all the different sites yes. you can you can get on. Um, and then it can, you know, you can have a career, but it's very different than anything I would have experienced before. So that is something, I, I, and frankly, I wasn't even interested, except that I was like, wow, this sounds different. And it can involve lots of keyboards and uh, I can have fun with a lot of my instruments. And it's just, just using a different side of my brain because it's not like writing a three and a half minute pop song at all. Sure. In fact, you have to throw, you have to throw a lot of those skills out the window uh, and that's fine so i've been i've been having fun exploring that world uh again simply because it's different uh at something in this and and but it still get to make use of my creativity and uh my various skill sets and and so forth so i'll keep everybody um, posted well do you have time for one clickbaity question and then uh you'll be free of me uh i i have time for more so don't feel we have to get off the phone in 10 minutes or anything, whatever works. Yeah. So the name Wolfgang Van Halen came up and in doing some research on you, supposedly if the story is correct, Kiss Alive is one of your first records. So most people just kind of think of you as being Mr. Beach Boys, Beach Boys. <laughs> but the reality is you do have a little bit of the hard rock past to you. I'm curious if you worked with any member of Van Halen on anything at any time and or if Van Halen was an early influence, considering that the keyboards were very big uh, part of the Van Halen discography after the 1984 album. Uh, so uh, uh, this won't be a quick answer, but I'm happy to answer this question because it makes me smile. So um, when I finally saved enough money to buy my own, like, I, like I realized, oh, I can save money from my paper out and like buy records and music that I want. As long as my parents give me permission to do it, yeah. First album I threw my hard-earned money on was Kiss Alive 1. It cost me $7, and that was like $50 at the time yeah. to me. Uh, I couldn't have been happier. Uh, my mom was in horror, um, not, not because she didn't like think it was okay rock and roll or whatever. She just didn't like all the posters from the inside pulled out that most kids would like take all the staples out and then plaster all over their walls. You know, and you got Gene Simmons throwing blood up over your son's bed and stuff <clears throat> couldn't have looked more uh, anti-Christ. 
being raised yeah. in a strong Catholic household. Uh, for, but for, I couldn't for, have been happy about that. a rabbinical school like Gene Simmons. He was doing some Antichrist-ish things. So, there, there you go. Uh, <laughs> and then, follow up your question, the second album I saved my money for and then spent my hard... I was so into like double record sets because I was just like more bang for your buck kind of thing was Endless Summer, Beach Boys. Um, and, uh, but look, I'm, a, I'm the prime age for all things post-British invasion and classic rock mm -hmm. uh, as well as disco <laughs> and, and early punk and stuff. And, uh, but I grew up in the suburbs, so punk was not going to arrive there for a very long time. Yeah. And, um, but all things classic rock and middle of the road did. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, that's, you know, so Van Hay, Van Hay, I remember being on my school playground and somebody had the brilliant idea of during lunchtime, they hooked up speakers and they would have a little kid like DJ in, in the cafeteria. And we just heard speak uh, music coming out of the speakers. Like, where's this? This is so cool. While we're playing basketball or whatever. Uh, and I'll never forget that happened. And then three weeks later, Van Halen one came out. And so the, the kid just played Van Halen one, like all, all day. And we were all like, Oh my God, what is this? It's so freaking good. Blah, 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 blah. And, uh, so Van, Van Halen was front and center, uh, as a soundtrack to growing up at that time. And, and I did, I did genuinely like them and I, and without analyzing it, it's very clear that their pop writing sensibilities are what hooked me in. Like I didn't, I would hear Eddie Van Halen play fast and stuff, but they just sounded like a regular rock band to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, everybody was doing that. Everybody had a blazing lead guitarist at the time. Yes. Um, whether it was Frampton or Jimmy Page, it was just like, well, of course. And, um, or Ace Frehley. <laughs> or Ace. And, um, uh, so uh, it wasn't until later that I grew to appreciate them as actual musicians and as a band and Michael Anthony's incredible harmony vocals and the Ted Templeman production, the very strip you know, it was like Van Halen for the late 70s. I mean, uh, Nirvana for the late seventies kind of thing. And, yeah. Um, and to this day, love Van Halen. And interestingly enough, by the time the album 1984 came out, I was so into like punk rock and jazz. And, and by the time that just sounded like corporate, like Van Halen had sold out. So the fact that they were playing keyboards to me just sounded cheese ball to me. Um, and oh. I, and I, I even I understood that though I didn't own any large synthesizers at the time, um, but that was that that stock synth brass sound that he was using on Jump, and I was like, oh my god, that's so hack and that's so boring. Uh, and it would be years before I would I would be able to let go of that and just appreciate some of the songwriting on the 1984 album, because um, I was I was in that thousand miles an hour of divorcing myself from. Well, you know, just just moving past all the corporate rock cliche that I that I'd grown up with, and so suddenly all these uh, post punk and art school and death rock things coming out of England at the time were very very fascinating to me. It was whether it was Smiths, Echo and the Bunnymen, The Cure, all that stuff. I was like, oh, listen to how you know the band Japan. Like, listen to how Richard Barbieri is using keyboards. I've never heard anything like that before. Listen to how Gary Newman's using keyboards. I've never heard anything like that. You know. Um, that's what was fascinating to me at the time. Um, have never met or worked with anybody in Van Halen, unfortunately. I uh, had a great experience with my friends in the Beck Band seeing uh, one of their last shows at the Hollywood Bowl before Eddie oh. passed away. Yeah, Wolf, Wolfie was playing bass, but it was DLR and everybody. That was fantastic because, uh, what, you know, there are things in the Beck Band that bond us together from Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds to Devo to you name it. And then by uh, um, some miracle, Van Halen is also one that almost everybody in the band like just adores. Um, and uh, so it was fun to share that with them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, uh, thanks to producer Julian Raymond, I got to work with uh, Cheap Trick uh, pretty extensively. And yeah. uh, I mean, I still, when I look back on that, because that was all about 10 years ago or more now, I, it seems like, wait, did that really happen? It's just like this weird dream. Like, how is that even possible that all these things lined up for me to be a part of that in some small way? And, uh, um, you know, and that and those guys clearly are heroes from back then as well. Absolutely. Well, that was a fantastic answer. I think that <laughs> proves that you're a good hang. People don't know that you're a good hang, but you wouldn't keep working if you weren't a good hang and didn't have good gear. 
So <laughs> those are the two absolutes. So bottom line is I'm looking forward to your next music, whether it's solo, whether it's Jellyfish-esque, whether it's a session, whatever it is, Roger, thank you again for the decades of doing what it is that you do. Thank you, Darren. That feels really good, and I appreciate all the kind words. Outro.